Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is a class on the New Testament Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, an introduction for Muslims. Uh, I will be your uh, instructor, inshallah ta'ala, Ali Athai. Um, before we begin, uh, the actual uh, first gospel, which is going to be the gospel according to Mark, just a few words about the importance of having interdisciplinary knowledge. Uh, this vastly improves our outreach efforts, our, our da'wah efforts to the non-Muslim community, especially the Judeo-Christians uh, in the West. It's important for us to understand where they're coming from and to be able to make those connections uh, in, in our religious faiths. Uh, the discipline of comparative religion is really uh, a Muslim contribution to the world. And this is basically by consensus of even Western scholars that the first uh, scholars to actually write objectively uh, about religion, religions in general, uh, documenting them, uh, talking about their historical development, their origins and founders, were really Muslim theologians. And uh, some of the great ones are Shah Rastani uh, and uh, Abu Rayhan al-Biruni, who's, who's polymath, who's basically credited for inventing this discipline known as comparative religion. So this is something that is an art form or a science that is part of our tradition as Muslims. This is something that we gave to the world, and this is something that we need to engage in. The Christians at the time, in the medie medieval times, when these scholars were writing, uh, most of their works were primarily polemical in nature. They weren't trying to objectively or near objectively present other religions, especially Islam. They're basically vilifying Muslims in Islam and attacking them. Uh, the first Christian to really write a uh, sort of academic, if you will, refutation of Islam was a man named John of Damascus or John Damascene, who lived in the 8th century uh, in Damascus, obviously under Muslim rule. The majority uh, populace at the time, however, was Christian, and he knew Arabic. But the problem with John Damascene is that he actually believed that Islam was a Christian heresy, not a separate independent faith. So his understanding of the religion was very weak. And he has a book um, concerning heresies, and the final chapter is called Concerning the Ishmaelite Heresy. He doesn't even call the Muslims Muslims. He calls them Ishmaelites or Hagarians. Uh, then we have Peter the Venerable, so-called Venerable, he was the abbot of Cluny, um, who wrote books about Islam as well, uh, and in order to refute religious beliefs of the Muslims. Uh, but here again, primarily, we don't have objective presentations of the religion. What we have is uh, polemical sort of attacks, vitrolic sort of attacks against the Prophet wasallam. for example. He actually claims Peter uh, the Venerable he actually claims that the Prophet ﷺ was born, or actually passed, in the year 666. And of course, if you know anything about the date, 666, this was uh, the number of the Antichrist, according to the book of Revelation, which is a book that we're going to be talking about briefly, although this class is basically focused, more, more focused on the four Gospels, Al-Anajil Al-Arba'a, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the New Testament tradition. We're going to talk about these other books as well, uh, as well and to understand uh, these books a little more in detail. Of course, you have Thomas Aquinas, whose theology and philosophy is still the standard in the Roman Catholic Church even to this day. Uh, and, of course, he's known for the Summa Theologica, which is um, his, his masterpiece, his magnum opus, where he talks about, uh, it's really three sections. Um, they're prima parse, uh, uh, which is talking about God, and the second part talks about uh, um, uh, virtue, ethics, and then the third part talks about Isa alayhi salam, who is Jesus in the, in the Christian tradition. But he wrote another book as well, which is not as well known, but it's called the Summa Contra Gentiles, which means basically the refutation of the, the infidels or the, the, the non-Christians. And this book is really geared towards Jews and especially Muslims. And a lot of scholars actually believe that Thomas Aquinas here is specifically uh, rebutting some of the things that he's read from Abu Hamad al-Ghazali. Um, so this is the Christian tradition in the medieval times. Uh, we don't have really thing, anything really objective, again, more polemical in nature, nothing ironic, nothing really um, scholarly or academic. But in Muslim circles, you have this unbelievable growth of knowledge um, and uh, this birth of this discipline known as comparative world religion. So it's important for Muslims not only to be able to present the religious beliefs of others objectively, 
or near objectively, because true objectivity is probably a myth, but at least present the religion in a sense uh, that is fair and, and try to be balanced and at least, you know, represents the majority of what those people actually believe regarding their religion. But also there's a hermeneutical aspect to it. In other words, there has to be an aspect to the study where you can actually uh, evaluate the religious claims of others as well. So this is very, very important. Of course, every science uh, has ten mabadi, as they're called. There's ten foundations of every fan or every ilm, every science uh, or art. Um, and we won't go through those. Uh, but um, traditionally, this is called uh, al-milal wa nihal, uh, studies in uh, nations and creeds. In Kitab al-milal wa nihal, for example, uh, by Ibn Hazm, uh, he talks about this, uh, this aspect, analyzing other religions, but also giving an evaluative sort of commentary on the truth or falsity of these religions as well. And this is obviously done with, with uh, academic rigor, not to be... Uh, disrespectful towards those religions. The first thing we'll do, inshallah, is sort of give you an introduction uh, to the Bible itself. What is the Bible? The word Bible comes from a Greek word, ta, tan biblion, which means the book. So, for example, many of the ulama believe that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ahlil Kitab, the people of the book, Al Kitab here is the Bible, because the word Bible literally means the book. Now, more in detail, uh, more specifically, the Bible is actually a collection of books. It's actually a bibliography, a collection of books. You have the Old Testament, the so-called Old Testament. And of course, this is Christian terminology. When we say Old Testament, uh, Ahdul Qadim, for example, uh, a Jewish rabbi would actually be offended by that terminology because he doesn't consider the Old Testament to be old at all. That the Old Testament is binding and that the, the laws and commandments are eternally binding upon every person that believes in those scriptures. So this is a Christian terminology. If we want to be more precise in our language, we would call the Old Testament the Tanakh. Tanakh. And this is really an acronym. Uh, and it's, it stands for Torah, Nebim, and Ketubim. So we look at the Old Testament, we're looking at 39 books. 39 books. Beginning with the Torah. This is the written Torah, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, in Deuteronomy, uh, this is called the written Torah. This is the beginning of the Christian Bible, the beginning of the Old Testament. Uh, then after that, after these five books, you have 34 other books, but concentrating on these five books. So in these five books, you have, like we said, Genesis. This is, you know, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is how it begins. Uh, and you have the story of uh, the creation of Adam alayhi salam. There's two different versions of it. You have the flood. You have the um, you have the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The book of Genesis will actually end with the death of Yusuf alayhi salam in Egypt. Genesis. Then you have Exodus, which is the story of Musa alayhi salam. Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, Leviticus and Numbers uh, is the 613 mitzvot or the commandments that were given uh, to the Prophet Musa alayhi salam according to um, the religion of Judaism that are recorded in these two books. And Deuteronomy means second law, Deuteros Nomos, which is basically a summary of what was already stated in the first four books and a few more prophecies and laws uh, and whatnot. So this is called the Torah. And we have to remember also that the Jews believe in, in two Torahs, not just one Torah. There's the written Torah, which is the first five books that I just explained, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. But Jews also believe, and this is a classical Jewish position, and you know the religion of Judaism has gone through a lot of turmoil. It was effectively ended uh, when the Second Temple was burnt in 70 of the Common Era. We'll talk more about that when we talk about the Gospel of Mark, inshallah ta'ala. But uh, the uh, principal formulators or articulators of the Jewish religion are also from the Middle Ages. So you have people like Maimonides, and you have people like Joseph Albo, and you have Bahia, uh, you have Rashi, these different rabbis and sages in the Middle Ages, most of them working in Arabic in Muslim countries, uh, articulating their religion uh, and being systematic. These are systematic theologians. And this is the first time in their history that they really had the ability to do this because under Christian Europe and Christendom, uh, a lot of these things were outlawed and the Jews were pretty much under the microscope uh, during their entire existence in Christian Europe. And oftentimes they were exiled 
from different countries. We'll talk about that as well. That comes into play when we look at the Gospel of Mark and Matthew uh, as well. But the Jews believe, in addition to these written books, uh, there's an oral Torah, right? An oral Torah. So this is called the Tor. This is called the Torah, the Ketuv in Hebrew, the written Torah. And there's a Torah, uh, Bipeh, which is by mouth, an oral Torah. And this oral Torah was also given to Musa alayhi salam, and it was not intended to be written down. And the purpose of the oral Torah was to um, to safeguard the true meanings of the written Torah. So this would safeguard against somebody, for example, going to the to the to, to the written Torah and extracting, uh, you know, legal rulings or um, exegeting the text by himself if he doesn't have the requisite knowledge. So he'd have to actually go to a rabbi, and the rabbi he would sit with the rabbi, and the rabbi would teach him the written Torah in light of the oral Torah, right? So oral tradition was very very important, and this is interesting in our tradition as well. We have the tradition of the Senad. Right, the chain of transmission, uh, and it's really incredible because Islam did not have these church synods and councils that we'll talk about as well, where these bishops come together and they literally will vote on a certain issue to make it Christian orthodoxy. And the reason for that is because there's such disunity in the religion, uh, and there's so much sectarianism, you know, firqa, uh, that these these ecumenical, so-called ecumenical councils, were something that was very much needed. If you look at Islam. Muslims, you go to Mecca, for example, Muslims are basically doing the same thing, whether they're Maliki or Shafi'i or if they're Shi'i or Ibadi, whatever they are, Salafi, basically they're doing the same thing. So this is a testament to the strong Sanad in our tradition. However, the early scholars of Islam, for example, Ibn Ashir, when he wrote his Al-Murshid Al-Mu'in, uh, you know, 300 some odd lines of poetry, which is really um, a, uh, a distillation, to use the words of Shaykh Hamza Yusuf, a sort of uh, a muhtasar, a summary of a greater text, which was a summary of a greater text, which was a summary of a greater text, which was a summary of a major text by Imam Malik ibn Anas. The reason why these texts were distilled uh, or made more comprehensive is because the Salaf would write these books and treatises under the impression that the, the student of knowledge would sit with a scholar who would then give that student the oral transmission of that text. So the oral transmission is very, very important. In the Gospels, Isa a.s., when he's in Jerusalem, he's approached by Pharisees, a group of Jewish uh, scholars, doctors, and lawyers of the law, and they say, under whose authority are you doing these things? They want to know the Sanad of Isa a.s. It's very, very important. And of course, Isa a.s. is a messenger of God, and that's what he said, I'm a messenger of God. Of course, according to the tradition in the New Testament, he actually gives a different answer because he's very confrontational at times with the Pharisees. But obviously, the Senate of Isa alayhi salam uh, is that he's a messenger of God and he receives revelation uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's important to understand as well. Now, the oral Torah uh, eventually was written down, and it was written down uh, after the Christian era. And again, the reason why that happened is because when the second temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 of the Common Era, in order to um, preserve the ethos of the religion of Judaism, um, the Oral Torah was eventually written down, and now you have the beginning of what's known as Rabbinical Judaism, right? You know, post-Temple Judaism. Uh, and the first part of the Talmud, which is called the Mishnah, that's the actual Oral Torah that was eventually written down. We'll talk more about what is the Talmud later, inshallah ta'ala, because it's going to come up when we talk about the Gospel of Matthew, which is the most Jewish, if you will, of the four Gospels uh, of the New Testament. So you have the Torah, then you have the next 34 books in the Old Testament, which are split between what's known as the prophets and the writings. So basically, if a book in the Old Testament is named after a prophet, it's considered to be from the prophets, which is called Nebim in Hebrew. If it's not the name of a prophet, like for example, if it's 1 Kings or 2 Kings or... or um, uh, first and Second Samuel, um, uh, uh, or other books like that, uh, First and Second Chronicles. Then this is called Kitubim, the writings. So you have Nebim and Kitubim. So then you have, so therefore you have the Torah, first five books. Then you have the Nebim and Kitubim, which represent the latter thirty-four books of the New Testament. So you take the T uh, or the Tau from Torah, the Nun from Nebim, 
in the calf from Kitubim, you have T-N-K, and you add a few vowels, and you have the word Tanakh. So this is what the Jews call the Old Testament. It's an acronym. Torah, Nebim, Kitubim, the Tanakh. Christians call this the Old Testament. Jews call this the Tanakh. Okay? Now, the Christians also believe that all of the Ahkam, uh, all of the, um, the legal rulings of the Old Testament have been abrogated. And this is a very um, controversial issue in the news today with different, most of them are either fundamentalist Christian authors, some of them are atheists, uh, that will bring up this issue with regards to the Quran, that Muslims believe that the latest revelation will cancel the one that came before that, and they say, well, this is true in every case, therefore all of the verses in the Quran that talk about peace have been abrogated. Of course, this is not true, uh, and it's, it's not as simplistic as that, and this requires a lot of scholarship. But basically, they'll say this idea of nasr, right, this idea of cancellation, abrogation of different verses in the Quran, they find, kind of take this as being a way of Muslims sort of covering up these contradictions, so-called contradictions in the Quran, not realizing that this actually happens in the Bible as well. Christians believe that all of the ahkam of the Old Testament are summarily abrogated by the New Testament. They've been completely abrogated. They're mansukh of the New Testament. So that's important to understand. So basically Christians now are under no obligation of the Torah that they don't have to circumcise their male children. They can eat pork. Right? They're allowed to get a divorce now because in the Torah apparently it says that you're not allowed to get a divorce. Even within the New Testament itself, right, intra-New Testament, you have abrogation, you have nasr. You can see this very clearly, Matthew 15, 24, which we'll talk about, obviously, the Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus commissions his disciples initially, he says, go into, he says, enter ye not into any Gentile land. Don't go into the lands of the Gentiles, into the goyim, only go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But at the end of the Gospel, Right, Matthew chapter 28, you have the great commissioning, go into all nations, right? So Isa alayhi salam, at least what it says in Matthew, is abrogating the, uh, the previous command that he had given to the Hawariyun or to the disciples, because now their training has been complete as it were. So we have this evolution of teaching. We have this in the New Testament. We have it going from Old Testament to New Testament. We have this in the Quran as well, because this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to humanity. Humanity needs progression. That's how we are, right? So that's the Tanakh. Now what's interesting also is that uh, the oldest complete version of the Old Testament uh, in the Hebrew language uh, is dated to 1008 of the Common Era. 1008 of the common era, Miladi. So this is after Islam. This is the oldest complete version of uh, the Old Testament in the Hebrew language. So this is some uh, 2300 years removed from Musa alayhi salam, right? So that's a, a big span of time. Of course, you have the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which uh, were discovered by a Muslim, a Bedouin in Qumran in Palestine uh, in 1947, but the Dead Sea Scrolls are not complete. Uh, there are missing books. The book of Esther is completely missing. There's portions of the book of Isaiah that are missing. There are no teshkil, no diacritical notations in the Dead Sea Scrolls, so it's a big mystery on, as to how to actually pronounce many of the, the passages there. So it's not uh, considered to be complete. The oldest complete version of the Old Testament is dated 1008 of the Common Era. This is called the Masoretic Text. Uh, the name of the scribes that produced the text were called the Masoretes. It's also called the Codex. Leningrad. So that's important to understand. Uh, now, talking about the New Testament, coming to the New Testament now. The New Testament, obviously, again, is Christian terminology. The Jews do not believe in the New Testament in any way, shape, or form. Jews do not believe in Isa alayhi salam at all. There's no belief about him. Uh, he is mentioned in the Talmud uh, at times. Uh, you know, Christians will point to certain things in the Old Testament as far as prophecies of Isa alayhi salam. And Allahu Adam, some of them seem to be uh, pretty legit. Um, there, there are prophecies of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa in, in the Tanakh as well that are very compelling. Uh, but Jews, they don't believe in Isa alayhi salam in any way, shape, or form. They don't believe in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Talmud mentions some few disparaging things about Isa alayhi salam uh, that we won't go into. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us basically uh, when they said, وَقَوْلِهِمْ 
in qatalna al-masih Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah that they said in post uh, we killed Isa alayhi salam and then they have some sort of uh, descriptions that they give on how they killed him and uh, his, cursing him and things like that that we won't go into and they also say a few things about Maryam alayhi salam as you can imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also addresses this ala that they utter against Maryam alayhi salam a calumnious grave uh, charge so that's mentioned in the Talmud and this was written by rabbis <coughs> uh, after the Christian era this is also one of the reasons why Many times in the Middle Ages, in Christian countries, the Talmud was ordered to be burned by, by uh, church authorities because they came to learn of these things that are written in Jewish uh, scriptures. We'll talk more about that, inshallah, as well. So when we look at the New Testament, basically we have uh, four Gospels that begin the New Testament. These are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This is the focus of our study for this course, looking at these four books and looking at their... Uh, their origins, their authorship, basically the, the who, what, when, where, why of these four books. Looking at the evolution of Christology of these four books. What is Christology? This comes from a word Christos, which means uh, Christ or Messiah in Greek, and Logos or Logia, which means the study. So Christology is the study of Christ. So how does Mark look at Jesus? How does Matthew envision Jesus from a theological standpoint? How does Luke, how does John, right? Are they the same? Are they different? It's very, very important. Who wrote these books? Were they written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Who are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? How do we know that they wrote these books? What language did they write these books in? Where were they written? Why are they important? Why are there only four of them, right? All of these questions are very, very important. And the vast majority of Christians that I've come across in 15 years or so of interfaith work, the vast majority of Christian laity you know, those who kind of just go to church once a week and that's about it, they have no idea the origins of these books. They just kind of go to church, they listen to the sermon, and that's spiritually uplifting for them, obviously. Uh, but if you want to actually get into the, the, the studies a little more in depth, we have to sit with scholars of the New Testament and listen to what they have to say about the state of the book. And it's very, very interesting for Muslims. And this could really be a, a good starting point uh, for very quality da'wah or invitation to the religion of Islam, many of the issues that they have with the New Testament, in particular the Gospels, can be resolved by studying Islamic tradition, the Quran, the Hadith of the Prophet وسلم, and the work of the ulama of, of Islam. So you have the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This begins the New Testament. And then you have what's known as the Book of Acts, uh, which is called A'mal al-Rusul, uh, the Acts of the Apostles and the the Catholic version. So this is basically early ecclesiastical history or church history or apostolic history. What was happening uh, to the Sahaba, if you will, of Isa alayhi salam after his ascension uh, into the heavens. Uh, so here we have the book of Acts, which documents the early church, uh, what was going on with James and Peter and Paul in the early church. And then you have what's known as the apostolic letters and epistles. Uh, and this makes up the greater or the greatest portion of the New Testament. Um, and there's 11 of these uh, apostolic letters and epistles. And these are written by Paul. And Paul is an interesting person. He actually authored 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Paul of Tarsus, he was a, uh, a Pharisee from the tribe of Benjamin who initially persecuted the early Christian movement, and then according to his own testimony that we read in the book of Galatians, and also what Luke says in the book of Acts a few times, a couple of times at least, on the way to Damascus, he has this vision of the resurrected Christ, and he's immediately converted, and then Isa alayhi salam, according to Paul, uh, tells Paul to go and evangelize the Gentile uh, nations around the Mediterranean. So Paul goes to places like Ephesus and Rome and Athens and Thessalonica and Corinth, and he evangelizes them with his own understanding of what he believes the gospel to be. And that's fine, but the problem now is when we actually read the letters of Paul, we see that he has major conflict, major difference of opinion, not with pagans and Jews, obviously that's a given, but with other types of Christians, fundamental difference of opinion that he has with them. 
And if you read the commentaries, again, if you read from Christian scholars, who are Paul's opponents, like in the book of Galatians, when he rails against these people and calls them hypocrites and so-called pillars, he calls them dogs and so on and so forth, who is he talking about? The vast majority of Christian commentators, F.C. Bauer is the authority on the book of Galatians, he says Paul is actually talking about other disciples of Jesus that were sent from Jerusalem who studied with James, who's the brother of Isa salam. So, in other words, and we'll go over this later when we talk about the Gospel of Matthew, inshallah. In other words, Paul has major, major difference of opinion, fundamental difference of opinion with other apostles that are from Jerusalem that have studied with James. And who is James? James is the brother of Isa salam, according to history and according to Christian history. And he's also the Khalifa, if you will, of Isa alayhi salam, James. And James in Hebrew is Ya'qub had Sadiq. Ya'qub or Ya'qub, which is James in English. And the reason why Ya'qub became James is because early on, many of the Christians, they try to distance themselves from their Jewish roots because there was a lot of animosity between Christianity and Judaism. But James is Ya'qub, and his laqab that was given, his sort of surname or nickname that was given to him by Isa alayhi salam, according to Christian history, is Had Sadiq, which is the exact equivalent of As Siddiq. So his laqab is the same as the laqab of the Khalifa of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, Abu Bakr As Siddiq. And this is an interesting coincidence, they have the same nickname. Uh, so then you have the Catholic epistles. So basically the four Gospels, you have the book of Acts, and then you have 21 total epistles, letters, uh, or correspondences, most of them written by Paul, some of them written by uh, Peter and John, one written by James, and one written by Jude. But we have to say at this point, the vast majority of these books, all of the books in the New Testament, the vast majority are actually anonymous Nobody knows who wrote them. And this is not my opinion. This is not the opinion of, of, you know, secular Western scholarship. This is the opinion of Christian scholars in Christian seminaries, because this is a fact of the issue. When we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these books are anonymous. Nobody knows who wrote these books. Why are they called Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? We'll talk about that uh, when we get to the Gospel of Mark, inshallah ta'ala. So you have four Gospels, the book of Acts, 21 letters and epistles, and then finally at the end of the New Testament, you have the book of Revelation, which is an apocalypse, which are uh, basically a dream that a man named John of Patmos had while he was uh, on this island, he was exiled, and he had these visions of the end of time, what's going to happen, fi akhir zaman, and he wrote those visions down, and that's the end of the Bible. So the Bible, very linear book, right? So you have Genesis 1, 1 Genesis means beginning, because the first word of the Bible, Genesis 1, 1, is Bereshit. Bereshit means in the beginning. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim et haeretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's how it begins, right? Once upon a time. And then you read through the entire Bible, very linear, right? You go through the ancient patriarchs, then you go to the, the time of David and Solomon, the time of the judges in the, in the, in the divide of the kingdom. Then you have the uh, Babylonian, the Assyrian invasion, Babylonian invasion. Uh, then you have uh, the Persian period. Uh, then you skip across the, the Greek period into the Roman period and the New Testament. And at the end of the New Testament, you have the book of Revelation. So again, very linear, once upon a time, and then they lived happily ever after. And this is how man will write. Right? But if you look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an is not linear. The Qur'an is circular. So initially, when the Western Orientalist, who has a four structure that is very much Christian, because he is Christian, when he reads the Qur'an, it seems like it's a jumbled, uh, you know, uh, a chronological mess. Why isn't this in order? And the Qur'an actually addresses this issue. The Qur'an says, they say to you, why don't you have this in order? Right? Why don't you have it in chronology? Because that's how man thinks. But the Qur'an is not written linearly it's written circularly and there's a great wisdom as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will return to certain themes in the Quran and will not present his book in a linear fashion. The oldest complete uh, version of the New Testament, so remember we talked about the Old Testament, the oldest complete version of the Old Testament in Hebrew like we said is dated to 1008 of the Common Era, this is after Islam, this is a medieval text called the Masoretic Text. When it comes to the New Testament the oldest complete version of the New Testament in Greek is dated to 375 
of the Common Era, so considerably earlier than the Old Testament, which is very strange, because obviously the Old Testament was written first. Uh, however, this text, which is called the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, or is cataloged as Aleph O1, the entire text is actually online. I think it's at codexsinaiticus.org or .com or something, if you can read Greek, although it is translated there. The actual, uh, the actual manuscript uh, uh, was photographed under two different types of light, and you can actually read it uh, on that website. Um, but this still dates to about 330 some odd years after the ascension of Isa alayhi salam. So this is also very, very late. And the thing about the Codex Sinaiticus is, is that uh, there's actually extra books in the Codex Sinaiticus, like the Epistle of Barnabas, the Shepherd of Hermas. These are extra books that are not found in the traditional 27 uh, canon uh, books of the New Testament as we have them today. And there's reasons for that as well. And we'll talk about those as well. Exactly, you know, why are there 27 books in the New Testament? Why not 28? Why not 29? Why are there four Gospels? Why, are there, why is there only one ecclesiastical history, the book of Acts? What about these other letters and epistles that were written? Why aren't those included in the New Testament? So this is a very interesting study. We're going to get to that, inshallah ta'ala. But just a word quickly about our Christology as Muslims. So this is very important, some very interesting things here. Is that, again, Christology is the study of Isa alayhi salam. The study of Isa, the study of Christ. And obviously our primary text in this uh, area of study, in this discipline, is the Qur'an. The Qur'an is considered Dalil Qat'i. It is a definitive proof text. It's mutawatir in its transmission. It's multiply attested in its transmission. We believe that the Qur'an is the word of God, the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe that Isa alayhi salam is a genuine prophet, a prophet. The, the word prophet comes from the Greek prophetes. And this is actually a Greek word. We say Nabi in Arabic, and the word in Hebrew is Navi. And the word Navi is found many, many times in the Old Testament. There's actually a prophecy that we'll talk about in the book of Deuteronomy, which is called Hanavi Kamo Moshe in Hebrew, the prophet who is like Moses. And this is a prophecy of someone to come in the future that Musa salam prophesies that will come in the future that is similar to him. And we'll talk about that. Very, very interesting. We believe that Isa alayhi salam was born of a virgin. We believe that he could perform miracles bi idhnillah. So this is important. We believe in mu'jizat, in different types of miracles. There's mu'jizat, which are miracles that are performed by prophets, al-anbiya, wal mursaleen, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. So prophets, they have this ability by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to produce these physical sort of signs, you know, kharq uh, al-adat, these breaks of natural law in order to sort of support uh, their missions. Now these are not definitive proofs because false prophets can also perform miracles. So you have to look at uh, the sincerity of a prophet, you have to look at the nature of his message, if he's preaching tawheed, if he's preaching uh, selflessness, altruism, all of these types of things have to be considered and uh, taken into consideration. His istiqama in the sharia of the religion, all of these things are very, very important because there are different types of miracles. There are, there are things called istidraj, which are which sometimes translated as divine beguilement that a non-Muslim can do, which seems to be a break in natural law but in reality, there's no tawfiq and what that person is doing. And that person does not have istiqama. And that person is calling to his own hawa. So it's very, very important that when we see these types of things, and these things don't happen much anymore, it's because of the state of the human, uh, the, the state of the human condition. Uh, but in the pre-modern world, these things were very, very common. And the ulama had certain uh, stringent measures that they would look to when these things would happen. And of, of course, we have miracles, karamat, these charismatic exploits or talents of al-awliya, of saints, and there's, these are well documented as well, thousands of miracles. And it's part of our aqidah as Muslims, at least as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that we believe in the, the karamat al-awliya, the, the miracles of the awliya. And there's many of them mentioned, like we said, in Imam Abu Jafar al-Tahawi mentions them, Imam Ibrahim al-Laqani in the Jawhara, he mentions that those who deny the miracles of the awliya, then you deny them. It's part of our essential aqidah. So Isa alayhi salam, he could perform these miracles because he has a station of nabuwa. He is a prophet. We also believe that Isa alayhi salam is a messenger of God, an apostle of God. Apostle also comes from a Greek word, apostolos, 
which means someone who is sent out or sent forth. Isa alayhi salam, he, or someone who receives some sort of message. And Isa alayhi salam obviously receives a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is called Al-Injil. Injil seems to be the Arabic sort of way of saying Evangelion or Evangelon, right, which is also uh, a Greek word. According to the Quran, Isa alayhi salam is also the Christ. He is HaMashiach, he is Al-Masih, he is the Christ. In other words, he is the one, the anointed one, that the Bani Israel were waiting for uh, to come uh, and unite them or to give them the true essence of their religion. According to uh, our conception of the Christ, one of his primary functions is to prepare the Bani Israel and by extension prepare the world for the coming of Ahmad وسلم, who is the final messenger of God. And this is based on a verse in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Isa alayhi salam said, O children of Israel, I'm the messenger of God sent to you, confirming the Torah which came before me. And this is very important when we talk about does Isa alayhi salam confirm the Torah or does he cancel it? Or is it somewhere in the middle? This is a big controversy, a big difference of opinion, at least amongst Christians, uh, as to the function of the law, the Torah, when it comes to Isa alayhi salam. And then he says, and to give you glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmad. And of course we know the name Ahmad is another name for the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of the ulama have mentioned that the name of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the terrestrial, in the celestial realm above the uh, the mulk in the Malakut in the Jabarut is Ahmad uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or his name on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah will be Ahmad. Allahu Alam. So unlike Judaism that does not believe that Isa Alaihi Wasallam is the Christ, so even though this is a Jewish concept, right, the concept of the Messiah is a Jewish concept, uh, the Jews did not accept Isa alayhi salam as the Messiah. And there have been many uh, would-be Messiahs in their, in their history. Uh, a lot of messianic claimants, uh, Isa alayhi salam, to them is just another one of those. Um, and then they had, uh, you know, in, in the year 6 of the Common Era, Judas the Galilean, who claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, Barabbas at the time of Isa alayhi salam, might have claimed to be the Messiah. Certainly Barabbas, the son of the father, is a messianic patronymic uh, and it seems like his followers were touting him to be the Messiah. Uh, after Isa alayhi salam, you have a number of messianic claimants. Uh, the most famous of course is Simon Bar Kokhba uh, who was executed by the Romans in 125 of the Common Era. This was a global movement. Uh, basically 1,000, 60,000 or so Jews were killed in Jerusalem. Uh, by the Romans because of this uprising. And you have other ones down the line. Uh, in the Middle Ages, um, you have uh, Shabtai Svi, who uh, died in um, 1666, or he actually uh, claimed to be the Messiah in the year 1666. Uh, and uh, he was a European Jew who went to Jerusalem, was endorsed by big rabbis in Jerusalem to be the Messiah. Uh, he was captured by the, uh, the Ottoman Sultanate, uh, and uh, because he was claiming to be the Messiah, and you know, just claiming to be the Messiah is not like you're claiming to be some spiritual mystic. It, it carries with it uh, a very clear political implication. So anyone who claims to be the Messiah is basically claiming to be the rightful king of the planet Earth. So the Ottomans, uh, they understood that about his claim. So this is treason, this is clear khiyana. So they gave him a choice because khiyana, even by today's standards, if you make khiyana against, for example, an American citizen uh, um, conspires against his own government, this is treason and it's punishable by death. And it's the same in the pre-modern world as well. So the Ottoman Sultan, he said to Shabtai Svi, he said, you have a choice, either repent uh, of your claim and we'll let you go and you can be Muslim or you're going to be put to death. And of course, Shabtai Svi very famously he relinquished his claim uh, to messiahship and became a Muslim and changed his name to Muhammad something and he lived uh, the rest of his life as a normal Muslim. So there have always been these messianic claimants, the most famous of whom was Isa alayhi salam. At least from a Jewish perspective, he was not the messiah. Christians and, and Muslims obviously accept him as the messiah and this is a great uh, um, topic of unity that we can come together as Muslims and Christians. Of course, the significant significance of what it means for him to be the Messiah at times is radically different between Christianity and Islam. But nonetheless, we both, both groups believe that he was the Messiah. 
So again, when I say the words, you know, the Christ, uh, we, immediately we think of Christianity, and that's just the way that we've been, you know, sort of socialized. It's an immediate signifier of Christianity. But the Christ concept is a very Jewish, monotheistic concept. Also, also if I say, for example, if I say the Holy Spirit, right? If I say the Holy Spirit, immediately, most people at least will think of Christianity because the Christians have sort of monopolized this term, the Holy Spirit. But the Ruach Kadosh in Hebrew, Holy Spirit, has its origins in Judaism, not in Christianity. The Christians took from that concept, obviously, and they changed it theologically, but it is a Jewish concept. It is a monotheistic concept. Even if I say something like God the Father, right, that sounds like Christian confessional language, right? If, for example, if I quote to you the Nicene Creed, this is basically the the orthodox Akida of Christianity. It says in the Greek language, Pisteo omen en eis hena theon patera pantokratora, we believe in one Father, God the creator of all, right? God the Father. It immediately reminds you or makes you think of Christianity. But God the Father, I mean, God is called Father in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 64, verse 16, one of the du'a that are mentioned by Isaiah, one of the supplications is, Atta Adonai Avino, you are the Lord our Father, right? And of course, the Jews do not mean this in a literal sense, right? So again, when the Jew says God is our Father, he means Rabb, he is our sustainer, he is our cherisher. We have that sort of, uh, it's a symbolical title, right? That we have that love of God, as if, ka'anna, as if he is our Father. Of course, this whole concept, according to Islam, um, was destroyed, this sort of metaphysical, metaphysical aspect of God being our Father, and it was made very much uh, literal uh, by the Christian uh, bishops and various ecumenical church councils, that, G that, that God the Father is literally, literally the Father of Jesus who begot Isa alayhi So that's obviously something that's condemned in the Quran, also condemned in Jewish circles as well. Uh, so that's important to, to remember. How did Isa alayhi salam, because if you read in the New Testament Gospels, you read Isa alayhi salam referring to God as his father. How does he mean it? Does he mean that God is his father who begot him, literally? No. Jesus, peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, is in a very Jewish context. So the way that he's using these terms is in a very Jewish way. We cannot ignore the social and theological context of the Christ event, of the Jesus event, uh, because then uh, we're reading into things anachronistically. Isa alayhi salam, when he refers to God as his father, he doesn't mean it in the Nicene sense of the word. That's an anachronistic reading outside of time. That's not being logical in the way we approach the New Testament. That's not how he meant it. He's simply using the, the terminology or the synagogue liturgy that's available to him. That's why when we read the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 11, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11, something in, that Matthew and Luke have in common, uh, when he teaches his disciples how to pray, he says in the, in the Syriac language, Avun Davashmayo, our Father who art in heaven. Not just my Father, but all of us. Right? And he means this obviously in a metaphorical sense, not in the literal sense. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he refrains from using this attribute of Ab or Walad or Ibn, we don't use these, you know, Abna'ullah. We don't use these types of things anymore because they've been corrupted over time um, by Christian orthodoxy. So that's uh, important to understand as well. So the Quran says that they say that Allah has begotten children. Bal ibadu mukramun. No, these are servants raised to honor. These are servants that have takrim, right? That they're simply saying these are sons and daughters of God. They're not literal sons and daughters of God. We don't say that anyone, we do not say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begets nor, nor was he begun. We, that's what we believe. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. That's what we say. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. And that's what we believe. God did not give birth nor was he given birth to. Right? So that's very, very important. Uh, of course, when Christians say that Jesus is begotten, not made, right? Um, unless they're Mormon, they're not saying that you know, God had physical relations with Maryam, for example. The Mormons will say that, right? 
but the vast majority of Christians that are Protestant, Orthodox, and Easter, and, and uh, Catholic, they don't believe that. When they say Jesus is begotten, and this is important, when Jesus is begotten, not made, they simply mean that Isa a.s. is uncreated. He's not created by God. He's not from the makhluqat, right? This is what they mean, that the Son has pre-eternality, right? Which, again, is a paradox, because they still believe, however, that he was caused by God, right? He was caused by God, which means what? That God is a monarch, then. That God has priority over the Son, because he is the, the cause of the Son, who is the effect. But Christian scholars would say, no, there is no essential or temporal or ontological priority of the Father over the Son, because these things were done outside of time, right? Nonetheless, Muslims would disagree and say, even so, if something causes something else, the effect of that cause is by its very nature inferior to the primal cause, whether it was inside or outside of time. For example, I have a ring on my hand, right? And if I move my hand like this, the ring moves, right? It's done at the same time. My hand and my ring moves at the same time. But can my ring move without my hand? No, my hand is still causing it to move, even though it's done at the same time. Therefore, my hand is superior to the ring, because my ring cannot do anything by itself, right? So this is one of the logical arguments we can use against this idea that Isa is uncreated, yet caused by God. This is a, an orthodox uh, belief of the Christians, and some of it is based on Neoplatonic ideas. We won't get too much into Christology, because this is supposed to be a basic course, so we're going to look at the four Gospels, but maybe in the future, inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk more about uh, Christian theology, the origins of theology, what is Christian uh, theology or orthodox Christology, and we'll talk more about that, uh, inshallah. So even if you look at the Old Testament, you have titles like Bene Elyon, right? Like in Psalm 82.6, it says that you are all gods, all sons of the Most High, Bene Elyon, sons of the Most High. So this is an honorific title that God calls the Israelites, you are my sons, this is not meant to be uh, in the literal sense. So, this idea of triune gods, right, a trinity, divine incarnation, right, that God comes down to earth in the form of a living creature, right? incarnation, this is a, a Latin root, incarnate, to be in flesh. God does not come down and reside in flesh. These are Christian ideas, these are Christian dogmatic beliefs that Jews do not believe in. They don't believe in these things. The Jews will use this type of language in a figurative sense. It's very important for us to understand that. Jews will say, yes, God is our Father. We are sons of God. There is a Holy Spirit. But none of that is meant literally. They believe, very much as Muslims do, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wahid and ahad. He's one of a kind. There's nothing like unto him. This is what they believe. And this is evident if we read uh, the Old Testament as well. So we would say as Muslims then, that Islam restores the true Christology, the true belief about Isa uh, the, the actual teaching of Isa salam, because we believe the Qur'an is a revelation of God, right? And we'll talk more about that later. What's interesting here, we're looking at the Gospel of Mark initially, is Mark chapter 12 verse 29 when a scribe comes to Jesus, uh, peace be upon him, according to Mark, and he says, uh, what is the greatest commandment, right? And Jesus responds in the Greek language. Of course, he spoke Syriac, and the New Testament books are in Greek, which is an immediate disadvantage for Christians. The reason why they're in Greek, and we'll get more into this later, but the reason why they're in Greek, because Greek was the language of the uh, colonial power of that day. The Roman Empire spoke Greek, so it's considered to be the lingua franca of that area in Palestine. So Syriac was a language that the Jews were speaking, mostly the peasants were speaking. Uh, so Syriac really didn't have, and Syriac is a, is, is, is a dialect of Aramaic. It's very similar to Arabic, a Semitic language. It really didn't have that ability to go into these Gentile lands um, uh, and uh, to be used in other Christian congregations that Paul eventually evangelized. So, Greek was sort of the language of the elite, the language of the, the, the colonizer. So, the language of the New Testament 
became Greek and not Syriac. So immediately we don't have what's known as the Ipsissima Verba of Isa a.s. in the New Testament. Ipsissima Verba is a Latin phrase. It means the very words of Isa a.s. We don't have those, right? Because Isa a.s. his response to this rabbi in Mark chapter 12 verse 29 was in Syriac. We have no idea what he said in Syriac or it might have been in Hebrew, right? Uh, but what we do have are Greek translations at best. So that's the difference between ipsissima verba and ipsissima vox. Ipsissima verba are the very words of someone. Like we have hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. We believe that these are the actual words of the Prophet ﷺ. Of course we have hadith that have variations and so on and so forth, but it's still in his language, right? And if a hadith is multiply transmitted and it's a strong hadith and all of the requisites of the strong hadith are there, these represent the very words of the Prophet wasallam, the very words he chose, the word order, the syntax that he chose to express it, and this is very, very important because one of the first levels of tafsir is what's known as syntactical exegesis. You can extract meanings by simply looking at grammar. Just by looking at the grammar, you can extract meanings, right? For example, inna a'atayna kal kawthar, a'atayna, this is in the past tense. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Say, verily, we have given you kawthar in the past tense. So now, the grammar has a theological dimension, right? But if you don't actually have those actual words of a prophet, then you lose that dimension. So this is the problem now with the New Testament. We don't have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in Syriac. We have them in Greek. Nonetheless, Isa a.s., he responds to this uh, rabbi. He says, Akuwe Israel." Kurias hathias haimun, kurias heis estin. He says, Hear, O Israel, when he's asked the question, What is the greatest commandment? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? And here he's actually quoting from the Torah. This is very, very important. Isa a.s. is asked, point blank, What is the greatest commandment? And what does he do? Does he talk about the Trinity? Does he talk about vicarious atonement? Does he talk about he's the son of God? Does he talk about transubstantiation and all these other sacraments that these Catholics believe in or the Orthodox believe in? No. What does he say? He appeals to the Old Testament. He, appear, he appeals to the concept of God in the Torah. Right? Torah. He's quoted in the Quran as saying, I confirm the Torah. So he's quoting from Deuteronomy 6.4. Deuteronomy 6.4 sounds like this in Hebrew. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Right? Echad. Isa alayhi salam, he uses this word Echad. He's quoting from the Torah. Echad and Ahad are exact cognates. Of course, the Quran says, Qul huwallahu Ahad. And there is a difference between Wahid and Ahad. So students of Arabic, this is something that's very interesting, a, a nuance, is that when we say that Allah is Wahid, we're saying He's one, but that doesn't negate the possible existence of other deities, right? Because by and large, the Arabs at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, they worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they also believed in the existence or the possibility of other deities, right? So this is not Tawheed. This is not monotheism. This is henotheism. There's a difference. These are Greek terms that are English now. Monotheism means you believe in one God and you worship one God. There's only one God. Henotheism means that there's many gods, but you choose to worship only one. Right? So, for example, if I say that I am one man, I say, Ana rajulun wahid in Arabic, I am one man. That doesn't mean that there aren't other men in the world, right? There's other men in the world, obviously, right? But I happen to be one of them. But if I say, Anna rajulun ahad, I am one man ahad, now what I'm saying is, I am the only man in existence. There's no one else in all of existence that has the qualities of rajul, man, except for me. So one of a kind. When we say Allah is ahad, we mean He one of a kind, right? So this is the word that's used by Isa in Mark 12, 29. How do we know he used this word? Because he's quoting from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is in Hebrew. And it says, Shema Israel Adonai, Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Very, very important concept. And then he says, 
if you keep reading the, the passage in Mark, he keeps quoting the Torah. He quotes the Torah over and over again. Why does he do that? Because مُصَدِّقَ لِيَمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَ مِنَ Torah. Isa alayhi salam, he confirms the Torah. He says, وَأَحَفْتَ إِتْ أَدُنَاي إِلُوهَيْخَ بِكُلْ لَوَوَاخَ وَبِكُلْ نَفْشَيْخَ وَبِكُلْ مَيْعُدَيْخَ He says, and you shall love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, all of thy leiv, right, the qalb, all of your heart, and all of your nafsh, or nafs, all of yourself, and with all of thy strength, right? So loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Believe God is one, and love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then he says, love your neighbor as yourself, right? This is the essence of the message of Isa alayhi salam, the message of Musa alayhi salam, and the message of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa This is the essence of the message, right? So it's very, very important. <clears throat> And then, uh, you know, this word Allah, very interesting word, um, that, you know, Allah, the dominant opinion is that, because we hear a lot of things from different types of people, uh, different, you know, Christian polemicists, you have, you know, Muslim haters, um, you know, profligates on TV who are making a lot of money, writing books about Islam and so on and so forth, and they're saying, you know, Muslims worship a different God. Allah is not the Judeo-Christian God. Right? What's interesting is that Isa alayhi salam himself, the word he used for God was Allah. And this is evident if you study or if you've read the Syriac translation of the New Testament. So here we have the New Testament in Greek translated back into the language of Isa alayhi salam, which was done in the 4th century of the Common Era. It's called the Peshitta, or in Arabic the Basita, meaning it's very simple. Basita means simple in Arabic, and that's what it means in <clears throat> in Syriac as well. Very simple to understand Syriac. And the word that Isa alayhi salam uses over and over again for God is Allah. Allah, Allah. This is the word that he uses. So the next time somebody comes to you and says, Muslims worship Allah, who's a different God, or the moon God, or the Muslim God, whatever they want to say, you can tell them Isa alayhi salam himself uses the word Allah for God as evident in the Peshitta translation of the New Testament. The Old Testament also says, Lo the kul tamuna. You shall not make unto thyself the image or the likeness of anything. <clears throat> so very, very important. Establishing tawheed in the Old Testament. What does that mean? That means, Laysa kemithlihi shay'un. There's nothing like God whatsoever. So the Christian will say, for example, yes, God is one, God is Ahad, but Isa alayhi salam is Ahad. So then we say, how can he be Ahad? When he's a man, a man, there's other men. That's not Ahad, right? Also, Ahad entails that he's independent. Allahu Samad, he's independent of everything. Meaning that he doesn't <clears throat> depend on food and water and gravity and sun and all of these types of things like we do. He is completely independent of everything. This is the meaning of Samad. And the word Samad in the Quran is called the Hapax Lagamanan, which means that it's the only occurrence of this word in the entire Quran. What does it mean? It means everything is dependent on Allah. Everything is dependent. Kullu yahtaju ilallah. But Allah does not need anything. La yahtaju ila shay. This is the meaning of Samad. So when we bring God down and incarnate Him and put Him into flesh, this is called Tajseem, right? Tajassud. When we do that, what we're doing then is making God dependent on certain things. And this is the breach of the Old Testament that says, Thou shalt not make unto thyself an image or the likeness of anything. Right? This is God's commandment to humanity. God would not breach His own commandment, theological commandment, and then become a human being. So, that's the end of our first session. Next time, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to continue uh, <clears throat> talking about the concept of God very briefly, again, it's not a theology class, the concept of God in the Christian tradition, and then we're going to get right into the Gospel of Mark, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.